broadcasting this morning on Facebook Live. We're meeting live in the auditorium upstairs with masks. Uh, if you're unable to wear a mask, we're also meeting downstairs. So we've got several options. Uh, we're also broadcasting on 93.5, a radio station, FM 93.5. Uh, schedule of services, we have 9.30 a.m. Bible study on Sunday morning. Scripture reading today will be from Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. I'll be reading verses 28 through 31. Acts chapter 20, verses 28 through 31. And the scripture reads, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. For I know that, that this, this, that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Also from among yourselves, men will rise up, speaking perverse things, to draw away the disciples after themselves. Therefore, sorry, the wrong page. And remember that for these years I did not cease to warn everyone night and day with tears. At this time, we're going to partake of the Lord's Supper. We need to take our minds back to the sacrifice that he made for us so long ago. And each first day of the week, we partake of this in remembrance of him. Let us give thanks for the bread. 
most kind and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for everything that you do for us. At this time, Father, we are mindful of the sacrifice that your Son made for us. As we partake of this bread, help us to remember that sacrifice. All these things we ask in Christ's name. Amen. give thanks for the fruit of the body. The Father in heaven, continuing our prayer, we ask that you be with each of us now as we partake of this fruit of the body, which to Christians represent your son's blood given for us. We hope that we would do so in a manner pleasing unto thee. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Normally, we would be having our collection, our collection boxes in the back of the auditorium. If you wish to give, let us give thanks. Our Father in heaven, we thank you so much for our ability to provide for the needs of our families. All these things we owe to you. As we give back a portion of that for your work in this area, we wish to thank you for everything that you do for each of us every day. We ask in Christ's name, amen. Good morning. It's good to be here. Uh, I'm always counted a joy to be with my church family uh, that meets here in Sanford. Uh, I'm so thankful that, that you're in my life, and I hope in some ways I'm able to help uh, you as, as much as you uh, are a light in my life. Thank you so much to those who've taken the lead this morning, uh, those who have stepped forward to lead in this service and, and to, um, to be an active participant this morning. I thank you. Is that microphone too loud? Okay. I got a little bit coming back at me, so I wanted to make sure. <laughs> if it's, uh, it's too loud, I'll try not to talk so loud. Uh, but uh, uh, it is such a wonderful opportunity. Okay. I'm going to turn that off. studies on elderships and, and on the need for leadership in the local congregation. Last week, we, we spent some, some time looking at what Paul writes to our brother Timothy and Titus in regard to the qualities of an elder and, and, and what are the things that God looks for. What are those things that God requires of a man to step forward into that role within the local congregation? And so as we continue our thoughts this morning, I want to spend just a few minutes looking at the responsibility an eldership has to its congregation. Now, uh, these won't be some of what we've covered. I I'll ask you to go back and, and look at those previous lessons for, um, for other things about uh, leadership in the church and the necessity of it. But I I'm trying to make something really practical, um, trying to make some practical applications uh, of, of what, uh, of what a, a congregation really needs from its eldership. Some things that maybe we haven't covered yet. And then next week, my goal, or not next week, but the following week, I'll be with us next Sunday morning. 
the next Sunday, what are the responsibilities of a congregation to its elders? What does God require of us as members, as 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 the sheep of the low congregation, to to the eldership itself? And so we'll, we'll dig into that in a couple of weeks. As a way of reminder, please don't forget uh, this Friday at 7 p.m. Uh, Kyle will be with us, and I'm looking forward to that. We've been planning for that for a while. This is kind of our first real big, um, other than worship and Bible class event that we've had. Um, and we're, we're encouraging all of our membership to be here. For those who are maybe visiting from other congregations who may want to, uh, to join us, we're just asking they join us online just with the virus situation. Uh, those should be available there uh, for anyone who would like to participate and be a part of that as well. Uh, and, and so please keep that event in your prayers. Uh, please, uh, please make your plans to be a part of it. So, talking about eldership, and, and what is it that God wants from them in regard to their congregation? I want to point out four things for you uh, this morning that I think are very important. Number one, I, I think one of the number one requirements of any uh, eldership, any elder, is that they lead from the front. And what do I mean by that? Well, there is a tendency sometimes in our leadership styles, in, in our culture, that leaders sometimes become prodders. They stand at the back and they, they prod uh, the sheep where to go, the, the ones under their care, under their leadership. Sometimes there's a tendency to want to, to want to stand at the back as a commander on the battlefield and command from the back lines. That's not, I don't believe, the image in Scripture. I don't think that's the way God pictures elders. That's definitely not how He pictured His, his apostles. And, and I think the same applies. If you notice, if you will, First Peter chapter five, a passage that we have uh, noted uh, in our last uh, couple of studies. But I just want to go back there for a minute. And notice what Peter writes about what it is to be an elder. Now Peter had a unique situation. For Peter was both an apostle and a local elder. I'm talking about wearing multiple hats. Uh, he, uh, he covered the gamut on those. Uh, but he says in 1 Peter 5 and verse number 1, I, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder. He knows from experience what he's talking about. And a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Even as an apostle, he understands what it means to lead as well as a partaker in the glory that is to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God, that is, among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge. But notice this, but being an example to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, he, uh, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Notice what he says there, not domineering, not as an overlord of the local congregation, but as an example. You know, you think about shepherds and sheep, a uh, very clear uh, illustration here, the, the fact that shepherds don't lead from the rear. Uh, they don't push and prod the sheep, but they get out in front and they lead the direction. What do they do? They follow. Uh, Jesus, when he's speaking of being the good shepherd, he uses the same illustration about when, when the sheep hear my voice, they come, they follow. Uh, and so a shepherd ought to be one who leads by example. He doesn't just preach it, but he actually lives it. Um, I, I think Paul, in writing to Timothy, sets this out very well for us in talking to, to the young evangelist Timothy. It's an example I think elders can learn from as well. And us as individual Christians. But he says in 1 Timothy 4, verse number 12, Let no one despise you for your youth, but set the believers an example in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, in purity. Preach, um, Timothy's a young preacher, evangelist. He, he's telling this young evangelist, don't just preach it, but actually walk it. Show to those around you 
that this gospel that you're preaching hasn't just isn't something that just changed their lives, but show them how it's changed your life. Show them in the way you um, the way you talk, the way you behave, the way you show love, the way you demonstrate love for for the others around you. In your faith in God, you want to uh, you know proclaim that the importance of, of, of faith in Christ. Well, show them how much faith you have. Give them an example to aspire to. An impurity. Purify your life. Rid your life uh, of sin. Rid your life uh, of, of the things that would tear you down, tear down your faith. Purify yourself. And then later, in 15 and 16, he goes on to say, in regard to being an example... He says, practice these things, the things he's been taught. Immerse yourself in them. Soak them up. Why? Notice the, uh, the uh, conclusion he gives here. So that uh, your progress may be what? So that all may see your progress. Be that example for others to follow. He goes on in verse 16, keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. Persist in this, for by doing so you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Practice what you preach. Shepherds need to practice what they, what they teach, what they uphold. Uh, they can't uh, preach one thing and live a different way. It just won't work. Um, our children are excellent at poking hose, holes in, in our uh, sometimes uh, preaching us by noticing that sometimes we don't live up to what we proclaim. They notice it, right? What does that say to them? Well, it says it really isn't that important. If elders aren't living up to what they're proclaiming to the congregation, then what are you saying to the congregation? It's really not that important. I may be saying it. You may be hearing it. But man, actions speak so much louder than words. Lead from the front. Be there on the front lines. If you want the congregation to get involved in an activity, don't just prod and say, you need to get involved. You need to be involved in lads to leaders. You need to get your, ch your children involved. If you want people to get involved, you get involved. Show them uh, how excited you are. Show them um, by your actions, by your words, uh, that that this is important. Uh, if you want you want them to come and attend and be an active participant in gospel meetings, elders, you better be there every time. Uh, because when you start missing, when you start making excuses, then it's going to harm your example and it's going to harm your ministry as an elder. Number one, lead from the front. Number two, be alert to the dangers that face us. Jesus, again, in, in talking about being the good shepherd, says he knows his sheep, and they know him. Part of knowing uh, the congregation, part of knowing the flock, is, is actually knowing them, and knowing what it is they face, and being realistic about that. Understanding the temptations that await us when we leave these doors. Some of us, even while we're sitting here this morning, or we're watching online, or listening on the radio, you may be in the midst of some terrible stuff and, and terrible onslaught of temptation. Well, elders need to be aware of those things. And they need to be proactive and not just reactive. Uh, those are things elders need to be on the watch for. Go back to Acts chapter 20. I appreciate so much Dwayne reading that for us this morning. Notice again what Paul says to these elders. These are the Ephesian elders. They've, they've gathered together He's discussing with them some final warnings and uh, admonitions that he wants to leave with them. And he says in verse 28, Pay careful attention. Be alert. Be aware. Be watchful to yourselves and to all the flock. I think there's something important to note there. He says, Pay careful attention to yourselves. Why do they need to pay careful attention to themselves? 
sometimes we can we can become so concerned about others that sometimes we leave ourselves open up, open to temptation, to uh, to the traps of Satan. Elders and preachers would go for this. Bible class teachers, you need to continue to learn and grow yourself. Don't become so enamored or so engrossed in what you're preaching or what you're teaching or what you're trying to study with someone about or being so overly concerned about the congregation that you forget to care for your own needs. Elders have needs. They're not perfect. They're not perfect Christians. There are no perfect Christians. And that has to be something we continue to do. He says, pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock. Be watchful to the flock, to the dangers they face. One of the scariest things in Scripture to me in the New Testament is what follows. Paul goes on to say, in verse 29, I know that after my departure, fierce wolves will come in among you. There will be that tact, that onslaught from the outside. Satan is going to just unleash a, um, a, a fury of a, a destruction, attempted destruction on the church. But notice, that's not where he ends. And to me, that's not the scariest part. You know what Satan in the Father, and from among your own selves, speaking twisted things to draw away the disciples after them. You catch what he's saying there? He's saying that even from among you, the eldership, not the whole congregation, from among you, there will be men who will arise teaching false doctrine, trying to draw away the disciples to follow after them. That's a scary thing because what what we uphold elders as you know as good Christian examples. We look to them to to set the lead for us. We look to them for understanding of God's word. And yet Paul says you need to be careful. Because even amongst an eldership, false doctrine can arise. False teaching can arise. You can draw away disciples from Christ, even from the eldership. Elders need to be pay careful attention to themselves and to all the flock. He says in verse 31, Therefore be alert. And how passionate was Paul about what he's saying? He says, remember that for three years I did not cease day and night to admonish everyone with tears. How passionate does he feel about this? How concerned is he deeply? Elders need to pay attention to themselves, need to be alert for their own weaknesses. They need to continue to strengthen themselves in the Word of God. And they need to be alert to the flock. Sometimes things happen in congregations. Sometimes it's over matters of doctrine. Sometimes it's over matters of opinion. Who are those who are to stand in the? Who are to stand in there? In the middle of all that, and to care for the congregation. It is our elders. It's at those moments that elders are most needed to care for congregations, to keep them from breaking apart, to halt false teaching, to admonish those who need to be admonished, to correct those who need to be corrected, to encourage those who need to be encouraged. In Titus chapter 1, verse number 10, after discussing elders in the church. Paul goes on in verse number 10 to speak about why it's so important that these men men uphold themselves, purify themselves by the Word of God. He goes on to say, For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silent. 
They are, since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Now, he's not talking about outsiders. He's not. He's talking about Christians. How many of us have went through experiences where Christians get themselves involved in empty talk, in pointless, counter productive disagreements. When they try to take away whole families doing something they should not do. It's a sad circumstance for any congregation to get into and that's why we need men who will stand on the wall to uphold the truth to keep the congregation together to silence false teaching, to silence idle babble, things that do not make for gain but for loss. He goes on here in verse number 12, one of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy guns. What, what a terrible thing to say about a brother or sister. And yet that's what's going on. This testimony, verse 13, is true. Therefore rebuke them sharply that they sharply that they and notice may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commandments of people who turn away from the truth. So an elder is not just worried about the offended soul, but they're even worried about or should be about the soul who's doing the offending. So elders have a very difficult job. But that is the same task Jesus came to do. In Luke 19 and verse number 10, Jesus said, For the Son of Man came not to seek, or oh, sorry, came to seek and to save the lost. Elders are fulfilling that mission. Are fulfilling that when we, when they're able to reach out to rescue the perishing to stop the division, to silence false teaching. Galatians chapter 6 and verse number 1. Galatians 6 and verse number 1, Paul writes, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any trans transgression, you who are spiritual should restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted spiritual ones. Who are those? Our elders should follow, follow in that group, shouldn't they? They need to be out there rescuing those who are perishing, those who are struggling with sin. And so elders are to lead from the front, to be alert to the dangers that face us. And this kind of interweaves with the second point there, but Elders need to understand the difference between truth and opinion. Truth and opinion. Sometimes we have a difficult time with that. And sometimes that leads to a lot of difficulty. In Mark chapter 7, Jesus says in verse number 6, Well did Isaiah prophesy of you hypocrites. Mark 7 and verse 6. As it is written... This people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. Why, Isaiah? Why, Jesus? In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of me. You leave the commandment of God and hold to the tradition of men. And he said to them, You have a fine way of rejecting the commandment of God in order to establish your tradition. It's important that elders understand the difference between truth and opinion, the doctrine and opinion. Elders need to uphold truth, need to uphold the Holy Word of God, the New Testament, the covenant, the gospel, and anything that is taught as a fault taught in contrary to that is a false doctrine. They need to uphold the truth of God's Word. 
and they need you to give grace in matters of opinion. In Titus chapter 3, later in, in Paul's writing to Titus, Titus chapter 3, verse number 8, Titus, or Paul writing to Titus, writes, The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. Uphold to the Word of God, right? Those things are excellent and profitable. Notice verse number 9. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, dissensions, and quarrels about the law, for they are unprofitable and worthless. As for a person who stirs up division, after warning him once and then twice, have nothing to do with him, knowing that such a person is warped and sinful, he is self Condemned. Man, that's hard for us. Seven things God hates. One is one who would sow dissension between brothers. Avoid foolish controversies. Elders need to know the difference between what's truth and what's opinion. And they need to help the congregation deal with those matters that are true. They need to uphold those things and in an unwavering way. In matters of opinion, they need to help the congregation deal with those in a productive way. Find resolution to teach the congregation what it means to give grace to one another. And not to allow opinion or something even worse, foolish controversy, to split. It would be a sad thing for an elder to get himself or his family involved in foolish controversies that split the church. To allow matters of opinion to split the church. Elders must stand up for the truth and help the church to deal with disagreement of opinion and not to become the disagreeable party. One of gives that his children must be believers, that they must be obedient to the Word of God. Why? He goes on to explain this in verse number four, and I just want to call your attention back to four and five. Just quickly. Someone does not know how to manage his own household. How will he care for God's church? Our family to be believers, to be selfless. Because this man needs to know how to manage. He can't manage his own. thing is, people have disagreements. And I know you've heard this a lot, but probably, but opinions are like nose, noses. All the time. We all like to get to something where we can. Elders need to be able to deal with those situations. Paul says one of the ways a man proves this is how he deals with his own family. I like what the Hebrews writer says in Hebrews 12 and verse 14, and this probably should be at the top of any elder stall. Hebrews 12 and 14, strive for peace with everyone, and for holiness without which no one will see the Lord. So elders leap from the front, 
They need to be alert to the dangers that face us and themselves. Understand that on the spiritual well-being of the congregation instead of becoming overly worried about material concerns. Such an easy trap for any of us to fall into is to let the things that should be the priority become secondary because the world tells us the other know a lot about his character. I want you to notice something that Jesus does in regard to Judas that might seem a little surprising. Do you think Jesus understood Judas's character just as well as he understands ours? I think absolutely. Yet in John 12, beginning at verse 4, we note something about Judas and his relationship to the other apostles. John 12 and verse 4, But Judas Iscariot, one of his disciples, he who was about to betray him, said, Why was this ointment not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? And of course, we're in the context of Mary coming in and washing Jesus' feet with, with this very expensive spikenard or, 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 or um, perfume. And Judas... You know, uh, he sees what's going on, and and he 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 pipes up and he says, you know, why why aren't we selling this? This is worth a lot of money. Notice verse number six. He said this not because he cared about the poor, not where his heart was, but because he was a thief. John notes something very important about the character of Judas. He was a thief. No concern about the poor. What he said had nothing to do really with the poor, but the implication seems to be that the only reason Judas said this is because it was something maybe he would pilfer from the money bags of the apostles. And then notice how this verse ends. And having charge of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. And we know he's a thief, so it's not too surprising that he would steal. But isn't it surprising that Jesus put him in charge of the money bag? Did Jesus know this about him? And there's a deeper dive we could do into studying why exactly Jesus did it. But I think it says something about what Jesus was truly concerned about. That the money he was stealing was not really Jesus' primary concern. The soul of Judas was his primary concern. The soul of those he was reaching out to was his primary concern. And that's not to say that money and finances is not important. You go to Acts chapter 5 and you see there Ananias and Sapphira still are um, um, making false claims about the gift they were giving to the early church and, and how they that cost in their lives. It's not to say that finances isn't important. But it's not the primary focus. At least it shouldn't of our elders. Later in the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 6, in verse number 2, you notice what the apostles' attitude were toward these types of matters. When a dispute arose among the Hellenistic widows, or the Grecian widows, that they weren't get being fed in the daily distribution of food, and that, that, that came to the apostles' attention. It was brought there and you notice their response in verse number 2. And the twelve summoned the full number of disciples and said, It is not right 
that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Now what they're not doing is belittling the work of ministering to these widows. The apostles go on to set up a, a very um, well thought out plan of dealing with these Grecian widows, with these uh, Hellenistic widows. They say, select from among you seven men. And they do that very thing. Those seven men care for those daily distributions, making sure those widows' needs were cared for. But the apostles, the leaders of the church, what is their primary concern? And what is it they're going to devote themselves to? It is to the proclaiming of the Word of God, to the edifying of God's body of believers. We have deacons in the church. Not here, but it is an office that God has appointed, hopefully very soon. We'll have elders and we'll have deacons here to care for the needs of the church. But sometimes I think we get it confused, don't we? Unfortunately, sometimes you find congregations where the preacher does the elder's work. The elders do the deacon's work. And the deacons sit around wondering what to do. That's not the way God established. Preachers are not elders not shepherds, unless they meet those qualifications and have been appointed as elders. Just being a preacher doesn't make you an elder. And they should not be doing the task of an elder. Elders need to be doing that task. They need to be the ones leading. Leading in spiritual matters as the primary concern of the congregation. Deacons need to be serving. Just as those seven men serve, those Hellenistic widows, that's why God has It should be the well-being, the health of each individual soul in that congregation. Allow the deacons to do their work. So the elders can do this. We live sometimes in a microscopic society where we want to have everything in our control. But we have a very difficult time letting go of those things. I think we need to have enough trust in our deacons and our other good servants of the church to worry for those needs. The elders. Be shepherds. Lead. Lead the congregation. Care for the congregation. In a couple of weeks, we'll come back and we'll, we'll talk about the congregation's responsibility to elders. Did you realize that we have a big responsibility to them? And I think sometimes we fail them. You know, no We need to think about that. This has not been a lesson primarily devoted to the gospel. But this is a wonderful opportunity that you have to obey the gospel. We've talked a lot about the caring for the needs of the soul. Your soul is the most valuable thing you possess. It is really the only thing you possess. When you die, all the other things go away. You can't take one of them with you. The one thing you will carry is your soul. How is your spiritual well-being? Are you right with God? Do you need to obey the gospel? Do you need to know better what that means? I'd love to sit down and study with you, help you to better understand what it is God requires of us as individuals to rid our lives of sin. If you'd like to study, we'd love to help you with that. If you're ready to obey, you're ready to confess your sin, or confess Jesus as Lord to repent of your sins, to be immersed in the cross. We'd love to help you do that. If you're a child of God who's wandered away, you've gone back into sin, you need to confess that publicly, you need to ask for forgiveness, we offer you that opportunity. If we can help you in any way, please come together and stand.